I had uh, five brothers and sisters. I had uh, two brothers and three sisters. Well, it was Arville and Merle Hamilton and my sister, uh, Betty Henry, who was married to Bob Henry, who was an animal control officer here in Prairie Grove for a long time, and then a sister with the Lee Davenport lives in Farmington. Somewhere in 42 or 43, the war was still going on, and we moved from Cove Creek up here. We lived at Cove Creek, and we moved from Cove Creek up here. Moved out to the, uh, the two-story house out there by Bud Kid Lake and lived there for a while and then moved to Lincoln. Well, my dad was a farmer and a, and a logger. He made ties, cross ties, and mostly and sold them. And he used to buy uh, property down, down around Cove Creek, some of the old government land now, and he would just log that off and make ties out of it and then let it go back to the government. Well, I never was in the family business. My dad passed away before, uh, right after I got out of high school. And uh, so I, I was never in the family business per se. I went to work for a power company when I got out of high school and worked for them for 40 years. Oh, we well, we, we had to slop hogs and feed the horses and cows and milk the cows. And, you know, you got up of a morning and you seemed like you worked a half a day before breakfast was ready, you know. But you were ready to eat breakfast back then. It's not like it was nowadays, you know. It's But we... We milked cows on the farm. We had uh, seven or eight cows. That was your, uh, you know, that was your cash flow. Uh, that's what kept you alive through the winter time, you know. And then we we uh, farmed corn. We planted corn, beans, and just stuff that could be sold at market and tomatoes. I don't want to forget them tomatoes. Well, we hauled, when after I got big enough, I hauled hay, you know, for. You know, you haul hay for sign on for somebody that had a truck. You haul hay for a penny a bale, and you know, work yourself from about noon till midnight every day, helping somebody put up hay. You know, and that's about the only kind of work it was around here for kids back in. You know, or get you a job in a grocery store, which I'd rather been hauling hay. So, well, when I was a kid growing up, my mother cooked breakfast and dinner and supper, and a lot of times she would kind of. In the summertime, she cooked supper when she cooked dinner because it was too hot to fire up, and she cooked on a wood stove. And uh, I remember we didn't get a, the first stove we got besides the wood stove was a kerosene stove. It wasn't even a gas or electric stove, it was a kerosene stove. But, but uh, a lot of times, and sh the people back then, they would cook a meal at noon and then leave it on the table and just cover it up with a tablecloth. And that's what you eat of a night. Or a lot of people, they would just make a big pan of cornbread and you had cornbread and milk, maybe fried potatoes for supper, you know. But uh, we eat three meals a day and we all eat at the same time. And we, when my mother got up in the morning and fixed eggs, she didn't fry you two and me one, somebody else one. She went and fried the eggs, put them on a plate and you got off of them what you wanted, you know. But everybody got up and eat. If you didn't get up and eat, she put it up. You know, it was the way it was back then. It's, they didn't pamper us like we pamper kids nowadays. You know, my earliest memories of Prairie Grove was somewhere around 45, 46, 47. The, the I can still remember coming to Prairie Grove when the war was still going on before it was over with in 45 and. Uh, Prairie Grove was a booming little town then. Of course, stuff was rationed. You had these uh, ration stamps that you had to have to get groceries. The, my my father-in-law, later on my father-in-law, ran a grocery store here in Prairie Grove, and you would take your ration stamps to him and get your groceries, and then he had to have them to replace those groceries, you see. And uh, you come to town on Saturday and the cars would be lined on the streets of, of Prairie Grove. And back then they, they kind of vertically parked. They didn't park parallel so you'd get a lot. And in the back alleys would be wagons and horses and people that came to school. The hometown grocery even had a little pen back behind there, pens that you could actually pin horses up in. And uh, William Giles used to tell a story about when he... When he came to school, he'd ride his horse to the hometown grocery and leave it pinned up, and then he'd walk on up there to school, you know, which was just up from the old Methodist church up there, you know. And uh, we used to kid William about being one of those kids that had a little money because he had a horse riding school, you know. <laughs> but uh, 
that's my earliest memories. And I, I remember that, you know, and back then, you had to keep in mind, Prairie Grove was wet. They was, they were beer stores, beer joints right there on Main Street, you know. And uh, again, my, some of my wife's kin folks uh, sold beer there, you know. And that's what, uh, on Saturdays, you know, people come to town. Some of them old boys get to wetting their snorkel a little, you know, and get pretty happy about things. So if you had an old car, sometimes, I remember one time we, we, we would, specifically we came to town in a wagon because the tires on the car, you would have two or three flats, they was uh, old and raggedy and you couldn't get tires because they were rations, you know, and tires were one of the hardest things to get, you know, so we'd come to, we'd come to town in a wagon. And then I remember when we got a little better car, sometimes we'd bring the wagon because you couldn't get mom and dad and all the kids and feed and groceries in the car. And, my older brothers would ring the wagon and the rest of us come in the car, you know, but a lot of people done that back then. That was a pretty routine thing, you know, but you didn't, even up to the early 50s, you saw people coming to Prairie Grove sometimes in wagons and horses. Well, I, I attended the first two years, I attended school at Apple Hill. And then when, when they consolidated those schools back then, you know, and uh, I was in about second or third grade, they started sending the kids, you know, to Prairie Grove. and. And of course, we came to Prairie Grove. The other school, Cane Hill at that time had a high school, but uh, Apple Hill and Viney Grove and places like that only went to the, the eighth grade back then, you know. So when it's consolidated, I, we came to Prairie Grove. And uh, I went to Prairie Grove schools. Uh, w w my parents left here when I was in the sixth grade and we went to move to Lincoln, and then we went to Oregon and stayed for a couple of years and then we came back, I was in the 10th grade and uh, then I graduated from Prairie Grove in 1957, which was a good year. Oh, high school, it was, you know, I talk about those days as being laid back because really to, like today, you know, when we played basketball and and football and baseball. Uh, I tell people now, you know, you see parents there and they're mad and shouting and what have you. I don't think my dad ever seen me play a ball game. Now he would question me about it when I got home, but you know, they, they'd work till dark, you know, and, and, and I just don't ever, and then parents didn't, they didn't get all excited. You know, either you played or you didn't play, you know, but uh, I played, Everything was to be played. First football team Prairie Grove had, I played on it. Uh, they started that football team in 1955. Thomas Ray Cornwell, T. Ray Cornwell's son was a quarterback, and uh, I played two years. Uh, of course, when I say started in 55, you, if you graduated in 56, you know, and, you, and that's when T Thomas Ray and him graduated, and then in 57 I graduated, so we played on the Played on the first football team Prairie Grove ever had. We got our we got all of our equipment from uh, they called it University University of Arkansas uh, High School up there. We, they would discard that old stuff over to them, and we would get it from them. And first year we played. If you want a story, I tell you a story on Jim Reeves right now. First first year we played, we didn't have face guards. We didn't even have a bar on them, you know. Well, the second year that we played football, they got us helmets and they got the bars that screwed on there. And Jim Reef, this was six-man football. Keep in mind, there's only there was three down linemen and three people in the backfield. And Jim played right in the middle on defense. And he thought they put that bar on there for him a handhold. We played Midway, Missouri, and the field looked yellow from all the flags they threw from him grabbing the face mask when they come up the middle, you know. And Jim was... Jim was quite a guy. Uh, and let me tell you one more story about Jim Reef too. Back then, you talk about things being different. Back then, you wasn't tough if you had to have water at football practice. Now, that's, that's just the way it was. You can verify this. So we would split lemons, take lemons, and put a lemon in a quarter of a mouth. We'd have mouthpieces back in. And uh, we was running drills up there one day, and the backs would get the ball and they would run into the lineman and the lineman's supposed to tackle them. And Sam Tari cut and he hit Jim right in the stomach and Jim spit his lemons out. And he looked up at Sam and said, she knocked out my teeth. <laughs> so, but 
I always respected old Jim for that. He stayed in there. And the high school didn't have a lunchroom in 56 and 57 because we would have to get in cars or take the bus to go to the lunchroom at the old uh, high school over there. The old My classmates, Sam Tyree and John Austin, uh, H.B. Hutchins, and, uh, Vincel Whitmar, Marvin Foster was in my grade and two or three others, but and then there was Clydeen Tyree, she was in my class, and they won but seven girls in my class. And uh, Mary Helen Phipps and Mary Helen Pierce. Oh, well, the Crescent, of course, you know. Yeah. And then there was uh, Dude Neal, he had a, he had a uh, clothing store. I think he sold Big Smith, and uh, the Crescent sold Levi's, and then of course, Florence Hill, she had the mercantile shop and about everybody traded there, you know. And, you know, when you went in Florence's, I had, when you when you bought something in there, my old Hannah worked upstairs and kept the books and took the cash, and when you paid for it, they put the money in this little deal and run it up to her on the string, and she'd run the change back to you. They didn't take no change down at the counter. But uh, Florence, there was, was a hardware store and a grocery store and a clothing store that you could go about one door into the other stores there. There was three of them and uh, we we traded there and we traded with dude. And of course, everybody traded with the Crescent at one time or another, you know. And then uh, we bought we bought groceries. We bought some groceries down at uh, uh, the hometown grocery. And then there was two grocery stores, one on each side of the, one on each side of town. There was IGA, and later on, uh, Ronnie Stone and uh, Guy Sparks ran that grocery store for a long time. And then, and then when they split up, uh, Guy moved and bought a grocery store called Street. So I remember trading with Guy Sparks for a long time. The bank, well, the bank was just one of those places that you went in. If you needed money, they had a little piece of paper about that long and about that wide. And they wrote down what you wanted and asked you what you wanted it for. Uh, as you got older, if you had good credit and all and you needed to trade cars or buy a car or something, you just call the bank and tell them, I'm going to trade cars. And Delford would say, well, okay, come in a day or two do the paperwork, but you went ahead and traded or you went ahead and bought cows or whatever. And I'm not talking about that I was special. That's the way the bank ran business back then. Uh, a number of people would just, you know, call Delford. And uh, I remember one time, John Everett may have told you this story, but Guy Sparks was a janitor down there at the time. And John Everett was in Oklahoma and he wanted to trade cars or something in the he told him just to call the bank, and it was after hours, and Guy answered the phone. And this banker wanted to know if if a check on John Everett would be all trade garden. Guy said, well, I guess it would be, you know, so the bank aware did loan him the money. <laughs> but uh, that's, Guy Sparks just told me that story a hundred times before he passed away. Oh, Delford was good for this community. He was a Delford was a, I think was a was a good man for the community. Now he he also liked Delford himself, you know, and then, but uh, Delford really tried to help folks. He didn't try to hold them up or or strangle them. Not in my opinion, anyway. I know it. A lot of times I can remember my dad. You know, but this was back in the uh, the late forties, early fifties. You know. If things get to going a little rough or something, you need twenty-five, fifty dollars, you know, and you just go and sign a note. You didn't have to put up nothing or no collateral or nothing, you know. So uh, I think Delford Reef was a good banker. I think that I think Prairie Grove prospered because of Delford Reef being a banker myself. But my mother, I was raised in the Pentecostal Holiness Church, and we went to church most of the time at Lincoln. But uh, we did attend this Church of God down here some when I was smaller, but most of the time we attended the Pentecost Holders Church in Lincoln. I can remember when I was six, seven, eight, nine years old, going to church was a big deal because that might be the only communications you had with anybody 
you know, especially in the summertime. And uh, they'd have these old, they'd build these brush arbors, you know, and these evangelists would come back and they would have these uh, uh, meetings and they might go two weeks or three weeks. I used to say it would last until they quit putting money in the plate, you know, but uh, you look forward to those things when you were a kid because you didn't you didn't see somebody talk to them every day back then, you know. You was out there on the farm and the only people you seen was your own family, so. Things back then that we think about now, people get every day, you know. I was thinking the other day about planting some peanuts. Well, peanuts used to be, it was something that dad grew. And most of the time he put them out after he dug potatoes and things, you know. And in the winter time, you'd roast those peanuts, you know, on a cold night and it's kind of a treat, you know. And, Homemade ice cream and all that stuff back then, that was a treat. You you look forward to it, you know. What's, what is now pretty well a common thing, you know, was a treat back then, at least to us. And uh, we had a radio. We even had a radio back in the war, because I can remember us all getting around the radio and listening to the, the uh, war commentators. And then you listen to the Grand Ole Opry on Saturday night, you know. But... Uh, like I say, going to church in Sunday school, and we went to church. We went to church in Sunday school uh, on Sunday morning, and we went to church on Sunday night, and then we went to church on Wednesday, prayer meeting on Wednesday night. And uh, other than that, you know, like I say, making ice cream and inviting the neighbors over once a month or something at supper time or things like that it was about all they done for entertainment. Uh, it was rare. I remember my dad took me to Prairie Grove to see the movies, and we seen The, the Yearling, and then I can remember him taking me up here to see the movie Shane, uh, which is, I've still got a copy of today, you know, it's a great movie, but we didn't, they didn't do a lot of things other than just work and, and try to make a living, you know. When we lived down here, even up into 1948, at the two-story house, we didn't have electricity out there. Uh, you know, I can remember we had an ice box and you'd come to town on Saturday and you'd have to buy 100 pounds of ice in the summertime because you'd just get home with 50 and that's what the ice box did, you know, and then you was out by Wednesday or Thursday. But, but uh, it was, I don't know, we moved out there at that two-story house in 48 or 49 and moved into a house that had electricity, and that was a big thing. I mean, that's why I'm not too smart. I couldn't read by them cold old lamps. <laughs> <laughs> My earliest memories of the park was Jackie Clark, another kid in my graduate school with his dad had a store up there, and, uh, and they lived up there. And the Battlefield Park decided they wanted to take that store and house. And I mean, they was people upset about it because the Clarks didn't want to give it up, you know. But the park used that deal they got to where they can take it, you know. And uh, that's when the park first started making this move of of grading itself up, you know. And But uh, that little old store set... Uh, I don't know, somewhere down there along about where that second gate is on the left. I don't remember for sure. And then Jackie had a house there. And then the park surrounded that, you know, and they come in and started building. That's my first first memories of paying any attention to the park there. You know, I knew it was there, but uh, nobody paid much attention to it till then. And that, this was back in, I don't know, 53, 54, somewhere along in there. I can't tell you for the exact date, but. Did you know Dick Bain used to buy warts? <laughs> Dick run what's called filling station down south end town, down there by where the Pizza Hut's at. And he sold gasoline, kerosene, motor oil. And I think he had a soda pop deal in there. But anyway, kids come to town and have them big old seed warts on their hand. Now, that's the truth. And Dick would take a penny out of his pocket and tell the kid he wanted to buy it. And he'd rub that penny on that wart till that kid put the penny in his pocket and don't look at it for, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight days. Sure enough, that wart go away. <laughs> now, Dick Bain is Andrew Bain's grandpa, you know. But uh, they some people believed Andrew or Dick bought the warts, and some people thought they was going to go away anyway, you know. So I don't know which was a fact, but he actually bought them warts. But... Uh, 
Did you know about the time the city has talking about vertical parking a while ago? And the city passed an ordinance that people have more brakes on them cars wouldn't stop them, so they just run them up on the curb, you know, and let them sit there. And the city passed an ordinance that you couldn't park them cars on the curb, and it's going to be a dollar fine. So they hired Luther Jones to check that and write the tickets. The problem was Luther couldn't read or write, so you had to write your own ticket if you parked your car on the curb. <laughs> and he gave guys work done, got guys work done there one time, old guy that well, I ain't writing myself no ticket, you know, but Luther couldn't read and write, but they already him now to pass out them tickets. Of course I guess you know about the jail and love slaughtering. Love City's mattress fire in there. And they said that the smoke was, you know, just a boiling out of them bars and things. That little jail's back there and kind of isolated back in. There wasn't a bunch of stuff built back there. You just kind of growed up in weeds and things like that and grass. But they said when they got to it, Love was down on his belly trying to draw in all the fresh air under cracking the door down there he could get to, you know. And then another story was, when I wasn't old enough to see this, another story was they got him out and got him on the back and they was pumping his chest to get there and said it looked kind of looked like a choo-choo train, you know, the smoke puffing out of him. But when you went into the back alley, the only thing back there then was the, the jail and there was a little storage building in the southern on back there, but then the rest of it was just kind of in, uh, you know, fields and things. And that's where people would, you know, tie their wagons and horses up under the shades and things back there.